Section 1 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 1, Lecture 1. The Deteriorative Power of Conventional Art Over Nations. Part 1. An inaugural lecture delivered at the Kensington Museum, January 1858. Footnote. A few introductory words in which, at the opening of this lecture, I thank the chairman, Mr. Cockerell, for his support on the occasion, and ask his pardon for any hasty expressions in my writings which might have seemed discourteous towards him or other architects whose general opinions were opposed to mine, may be found by those who care for preambles not much misreported in the Building Chronicle, with such comments as the genius of that journal was likely to suggest to it. End of note. As I passed last summer, for the first time, through the north of Scotland, it seemed to me that there was a peculiar painfulness in its scenery caused by the non-manifestation of the powers of human art. I had never traveled in, nor even heard or conceived of such a country before, nor, though I had passed much of my life amidst mountain scenery in the south, was I before aware of how much its charm depended on the little gracefulnesses and tendernesses of human work which are mingled with the beauty of the Alps, or spared by their desolation. It is true that the art which carves and colors the front of a Swiss cottage is not of any very exalted kind, yet it testifies to the completeness and the delicacy of the faculties of the mountaineer. It is true that the remnants of tower and battlement, which afford footing to the wild vine on the alpine promontory, form but a small part of the great serration of its rocks and yet it is just that fragment of their broken outline which gives them their pathetic power and historical majesty. In this element, among the wilds of our own country, I found wholly wanting. The highland cottage is literally a heap of grey stones, choked up rather than roofed over, with black peat and withered heather. The only approach to an effort at decoration consists in the placing of the clods of protective peat obliquely on its roof, so as to give a diagonal arrangement of lines, looking somewhat as if the surface had been scored over by a gigantic claymore. And, at least among the northern hills of Scotland, elements of more ancient architectural interest are equally absent. The solitary peel house is hardly discernible by the windings of the stream, the roofless aisle of the priory is lost among the enclosures of the village, and the capital city of the highlands, Inverness, placed where it might ennoble one of the sweetest landscapes and by the shore of one of the loveliest estuaries in the world, placed between the crests of the Grampians and the flowing of the Moray Firth, as if it were a jewel clasping the folds of the mountains to the blue zone of the sea, is only distinguishable from a distance by one architectural feature, and exalts all the surrounding landscape by no other associations than those which can be connected with its modern castellated jail. While these conditions of Scottish scenery affected me very painfully, it being the first time in my life that I had been in any country possessing no valuable monuments or examples of art, they also forced me into the consideration of one or two difficult questions respecting the effect of art on the human mind. And they forced these questions upon me eminently for this reason, that while I was wandering disconsolately among the moors of the Grampians, where there was no art to be found, news of peculiar interest was every day arriving from a country where there was a great deal of art, an art of a delicate kind, to be found. Among the models set before you in this institution, and in the others established throughout the kingdom for the teaching of design, there are, I suppose, none in their kind more admirable than the decorated works of India. They are, indeed, in all materials capable of color, wool, marble, or metal, almost inimitable in their delicate application of divided hue and fine arrangement of fantastic line. Nor is this power of theirs exerted by the people rarely, or without enjoyment. The love of subtle design seems universal in the race, and is developed in every implement that they shape, in every building that they raise. It attaches itself with the same intensity and with the same success to the service of superstition, of pleasure, or of cruelty, and enriches alike with one profusion of enchanted iridescence, the dome of the pagoda, the fringe of the girdle, and the edge of the sword. So then you have, in these two great populations, Indian and Highland, in the races of the jungle and of the moor, two national capacities distinctly and accurately opposed. On the one side you have a race rejoicing in art, and eminently and universally endowed with the gift of it. 
On the other, you have a people careless of art, and apparently incapable of it, their utmost effort hitherto reaching no farther than to the variation of the positions of the bars of color in square checkers. And we are thus urged naturally to inquire, what is the effect on the moral character in each nation of this vast difference in their pursuits and apparent capacities, and whether those rude checkers of the tart or the exquisitely fancied involutions of the cashmere fold habitually over the noblest hearts? We have had our answer. Since the race of man began its course of sin on this earth, nothing has ever been done by it so significative of all bestial and lower than bestial degradation as the acts of the indian race in the year that has just passed by cruelty as fierce may indeed have been wrecked and brutality as abominable been practiced before but never under like circumstances rage of prolonged war and resentment of prolonged oppression have made men as cruel before now and gradual decline into barbarism where no examples of decency or civilization existed around them has sunk before now isolated populations to the lowest level of possible humanity but cruelty stretched to its fiercest against the gentle and unoffending and corruption festered to its loathsomeness in the midst of the witnessing presence of a disciplined civilization these we could not have known to be within the practicable compass of human guilt but for the acts of the indian mutineer and as thus on the one hand you have an extreme energy of baseness displayed by these lovers of art on the other as if to put the question into the narrowest compass you have had an extreme energy of virtue displayed by the despisers of art among all the soldiers to whom you owe your victories in the crimea and your avenging in the indies to none are you bound by closer bonds of gratitude than to the men who have been born and bred among those desolate highland moors and thus you have the differences in capacity and circumstance between the two nations and the differences in result on the moral habits of two nations put into the most significant the most palpable the most brief opposition out of the peat cottage come faith courage self-sacrifice purity and piety in whatever else is fruitful in the work of heaven out of the ivory palace come treachery cruelty cowardice idolatry bestiality whatever else is fruitful in the work of hell but the difficulty does not close here from one instance of however great apparent force it would be wholly unfair to gather any general conclusion wholly illogical to assert that because we had once found love of art connected with moral baseness the love of art must be the general root of moral baseness and equally unfair to assert that because we had once found neglect of art coincident with nobleness of disposition neglect of art must always be the source or sign of that nobleness but if we pass from the indian peninsula into other countries of the globe and from our own recent experience to the records of history we shall still find one great fact fronting us in stern universality namely the apparent connection of great success in art with subsequent national degradation you find in the first place that the nations which possessed a refined art were always subdued by those who possessed none you find the lydian subdued by the mede the athenian by the spartan the greek by the roman the roman by the goth the Burgundian by the Switzer, but you find beyond this that even where no attack by any external power has accelerated the catastrophe of the state, the period in which any given people reach their highest power in art is precisely that in which they appear to sign the warrant of their own ruin, and that, from the moment in which a perfect statue appears in Florence, a perfect picture in Venice, or a perfect fresco in Rome, from that hour forward, probity, industry and courage seem to be exiled from their walls and they perish in a sculpturesque paralysis or many-colored corruption but even this is not all as art seems thus in its delicate form to be one of the chief promoters of indolence and sensuality so i need hardly remind you it hitherto has appeared only an energetic manifestation when it was in the service of superstition the four greatest manifestations of human intellect which founded the four principal kingdoms of art egyptian babylonian greek and italian were developed by the strong excitement of active superstition in the worship of osiris belus minerva and the queen of heaven therefore to speak briefly it may appear very difficult to show that art has ever yet existed in a consistent and thoroughly energetic school unless it was engaged in the propagation of falsehood or the encouragement of vice and finally while art has shown itself always active in the service of luxury and idolatry, it has also been strongly directed to the exaltation of cruelty, 
A nation which lives a pastoral and innocent life never decorates the shepherd's staff or the plow handle, but races who live by depredation and slaughter nearly always bestow exquisite ornaments on the quiver, the helmet, and the spear. Does it not seem to you, then, on all these three accounts, more than questionable whether we are assembled here in Kensington Museum to any good purpose? Might we not justly be looked upon with suspicion and fear, rather than with sympathy, by the innocent and unartistical public? Are we even sure of ourselves? Do we know what we are about? Are we met here as honest people? Or are we not rather so many catalines, assembled to devise the hasty degradation of our country, or, like a conclave of midnight witches, to summon and send forth, on new and unexpected missions, the demons of luxury, cruelty, and superstition? I trust, upon the whole, that it is not so. I am sure that Mr. Redgrave and Mr. Cole do not at all include results of this kind in their conception of the ultimate objects of the institution which owe so much to their strenuous and well-directed exertions. And I have put this painful question before you, only that we may face it thoroughly, and as I hope, outface it. If you will give it a little sincere attention this evening, I trust we may find sufficiently good reason for our work, and proceed to it hereafter, as all good workmen should do, with clear heads and calm consciences. To return, then, to the first point of difficulty, the relations between art and mental disposition in India and Scotland. It is quite true that the art of India is delicate and refined, but it has one curious character distinguishing it from all other art of equal merit and design. It never represents a natural fact. It either forms its compositions out of meaningless fragments of color and flowings of line, or if it represents any living creature, it represents that creature under some distorted and monstrous form. To all the facts and forms of nature, it willfully and resolutely opposes itself. It will not draw a man, but an eight-armed monster. It will not draw a flower, but only a spiral or a zigzag. It thus indicates that the people who practice it are cut off from all possible sources of healthy knowledge or natural delight, that they have willfully sealed up and put aside the entire volume of the world, and have got nothing to read, nothing to dwell upon, but that imagination of the thoughts of their hearts, of which we are told that it is only evil continually. Over the whole spectacle of creation they have thrown a veil in which there is no rent. For them no star peeps through the blanket of the dark. For them neither their heaven shines nor their mountains rise. For them the flowers do not blossom, for them the creatures of field and forest do not live. They lie bound in the dungeon of their own corruption, encompassed only by doleful phantoms and by spectral vacancies. Need I remind you what an exact reverse of this condition of mind, as respects the observance of nature, is presented by the people whom we have just been led to contemplate in contrast with the Indian race? you will find upon reflection that all the highest points of the Scottish character are connected with impressions derived straight from the natural scenery of their country. No nation has ever been shown, in the general tone of its language, in the general current of its literature, so constant a habit of hallowing its passions and confirming its principles by direct association with the charm or power of nature. The writings of Scott and Burns, and yet more of the far greater poets than Burns, who gave Scotland her traditional ballads, furnish you in every stanza, almost in every line, with examples of this association of natural scenery with the passions. Footnote. The great poets of Scotland, like the great poets of all other countries, never write dissolutely, either in matter or method, but with stern and measured meaning in every syllable. Here's a bit of first-rate work, for example. Tweed said to Till, What gar is ye rin say still? Till said to Tweed, Though ye rin with speed, and I rin slaw, while ye droon I man, I droon twa. End of note. But an instance of its farther connection with moral principle struck me forcibly just at the time when I was most lamenting the absence of art among the people. In one of the loneliest districts of Scotland, where the peak cottages are darkest, just at the western foot of that great mass of the Grampians, which encircles the sources of the Spey and the Dee, the main road which traverses the chain winds around the foot of a broken rock called Crag, or Crag Alaki. There is nothing remarkable in either its height or form. It is darkened with a few scattered pines and touched along its summit with a flush of heather. But it constitutes a kind of headland, or leading promontory, in the group of hills to which it belongs, a sort of initial letter of the mountains, and thus stands in the mind of the inhabitants of the district, the clan Grant, for a type of their country, 
and of the influence of that country upon themselves. Their sense of this is beautifully indicated in the war cry of the clan, Stand fast, Craigalaki! You may think long over those few words without exhausting the deep wells of feeling and thought contained in them, the love of the native land, the assurance of their faithfulness to it, the subdued and gentle assertion of indomitable courage. I may need to be told to stand, but if I do, Craigalaki does. You could not but have felt, had you passed beneath it at the time when so many of England's dearest children were being defended by the strength of heart of men born at its foot, how often among the delicate Indian palaces, whose marble was pallid with horror and whose vermilion was darkened with blood, the remembrance of its rough gray rocks and purple heaths must have risen before the sight of the Highland soldier how often the hailing of the shot and the shriek of battle would pass away from his hearing and leave only the whisper of the old pine branches. Stand fast, Craig Alaki. You have, in these two nations, seen in direct opposition the effects on moral sentiment of art without nature and of nature without art. And you see enough to justify you in suspecting, while if you choose to investigate the subject more deeply and with other examples, you will find enough to justify you in concluding that art followed as such, and for its own sake, irrespective of the interpretation of nature by it, is destructive of whatever is best and noblest in humanity, but that nature, however simply observed or imperfectly known, is, in the degree of the affection felt for it, protective and helpful to all that is noblest in humanity. You might then conclude further that art, so far as it was devoted to the record or the interpretation of nature, would be helpful and ennobling also. And you would conclude this with perfect truth. Let me repeat the assertion distinctly and solemnly, as the first that I am permitted to make in this building, devoted in a way so new and so admirable to the service of the art students of England. Wherever art is practiced for its own sake, and the delight of the workman is in what he does and produces instead of what he interprets or exhibits, their art has an influence of the most fatal kind on brain and heart, and it issues, if long so pursued, in the destruction both of intellectual power and moral principle, whereas art, devoted humbly and self-forgetfully to the clear statement and record of the facts of the universe, is always helpful and beneficent to mankind, full of comfort, strength, and salvation. End of section one. Recorded by Christopher Russell in New York City.